Hello, welcome everyone to the Advanced Deep Learning Lecture. Um, in the previous lecture, we have talked now a lot about um, generative model. We also have talked a lot about GANs. And in this lecture, I would like to have a few additions in terms of GANs, like one of the very recent state-of-the-art. Style GANs is a very popular paper that a lot of people probably have seen. We had one of the invited speakers last year um, in the Introduction to Deep Learning course. And I would quickly want to mention that. Um, I would also like to go afterwards over autoregressive models, like as an alternative paradigm to GANs. But finally, I think we, we want to go from images to videos and want to see how we can actually generate um, sequences of frames. Now, yeah, we, the last thing we stopped was um, we had different architectures. And um, one of these architectures we discussed actually in the last lecture was the progressive growing architecture. Right. So the idea was we having a discriminator and a generator and we're growing each of these layers um, and we're adding layer by layer in, the layer in this blending based fashion so we can get relatively high resolution outputs while still managing to avoid things like mode collapse and so on. So style can is in a sense very similar. So it, it builds upon traditional, um, you know, these generators and discriminators um, that are trained with progressive GAN fashion. And, well, if I'm looking at a traditional um, latent space-based uh, GAN here, this is a GAN that takes here this latent vector Z, right? Um, and what it's doing is it has here a generator, right? And this one is, well, it has first fully connected layer, um, has a bunch of confs, upsample, conf, upsample, conf, upsample, upsample, and so on. So this whole thing here is a traditional generator, right? Um, and at some point we have a discriminator at the end, um, but what's happening here is that everything that we're feeding in here in Z will determine the output of the generated image, right? So um, for one given Z, we will get a, get a specific output image at the end of the day. Now, this um, the, the challenge there is, of course, and similar with the conditional GANs, and we have seen that this Z here doesn't have too much control, right? We can't really control and and manage to generate things that we wish like to, right? I mean, of course, there's things like semantic GAN and stuff like that, info GAN, um, where you can basically um, make sure that this latent vector Z corresponds to some to some semantics and so on. Um, however, it's still pretty tricky um, controlling C and making, making sure that you can generate images um, in a specific way. So the idea of, idea of style GAN now is a little bit different. So the idea here is um, what we do, we have on one hand, we have a latent vector Z. Um, we have basically a, a couple of fully connected layers and these fully connected layers, um, they form a mapping network, right? So this is kind of one network by itself that maps this fully, um, with these fully connected layers, maps the latent vector Z to some sort of interpretable style vector that we can feed into the generation network. and. The idea here is that the generation network um, is actually pretty similar to the progressive growing GAN. Um, they pretty much build it in the same architecture. They make a few tweaks like, um, uh, I'll go into the second, they basically um, yeah, have moved traditional inputs, they add noise inputs, they mix regularization, stuff like that. Um, but essentially it's still a progressively growing based generator. And what they do is they essentially on one hand, they're feeding some noise after after every few layers in. So in this case, they have one, two, three, four, four points here where they're feeding in different noise vectors, right? And in addition to that, they're also feeding the style output from the latent vector Z in. So we have here um, different vectors that are being basically added to the current feature maps, right? So we, and the way they're being added is with this adder in. I mean, this is the details here. It's not so important how they're being added right now. Of course, they tried a lot of different things, but the key insight here is that you having this progressively growing based GAN um, that you can train like that. However, now what you do is for every resolution, so to say, um, you're feeding in a noise vector. In addition, you're feeding in a style vector that you're adding to the noise and to the current feature map, right? Um, and you're training this whole thing end to end. And the idea is that this mapping network here will produce style vectors that are then being used for the synthesis part, right? Um, and the hope is that because these things here, they operate on different resolutions, 
that we essentially have style vectors in lower resolutions, we have some of them at mid-resolutions and some of them at high resolutions. So some of them are more like structural elements, some of them are more like for medium detail, and some of them are fine scale detail, right? So you have kind of this multi-resolution control of the image. In other words, if I'm going ahead and changing these style vectors here, I should get different, um, well, depending on which one I'm changing, I should get a different behavior, right? Um, and that's kind of the idea of style again. And again, these people, they, um, um, this is this team in, in, in Finland um, at NVIDIA, and what they, 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 have, they have really a lot of expertise in terms of training the scan. So they, have, they, they tried a lot of hyperparameters and so on. Um, the architecture I mentioned is very similar to the progressive GAN. Um, they made a couple of changes. So they have a few, few different things they changed. They have um, different tuning. They have a bilinear up and down sampling instead of a, um, just a nearest neighbor up and down sampling. Um, they have this mapping of the styles. They're removing the traditional input. They add noise input. And they have this regularization. Um, this is an evaluation on, on FID scores. Um, basically gets a little bit better than the, the progressive gain. But my point here that I wanted to make, I don't, well, I mean, it's nice to get better results, of course, but the really interesting thing is that now what they're adding with style gain is this explicit control um, of the gain. It's similar to a conditioning, right? It's similar to the way things like picks to picks have been trained, except if you're going back here, that here we have this mapping network um, that essentially generates these style vectors that we can then add to the feature vectors of the generator, right? So we have the synthesis network G and we have the mapping network F. And these two, two things, they interact with each other by having the style vectors being added to the feature vectors. Um, and in practice, they can generate results that look like these ones. And the reason why I'm showing them is because these results look really, really impressive. So what they have is they have coarse styles, right? They have this at a very low resolution. They have middle styles from 16 to, to 32 squared, and they have fine st styles on 64 squared to 1024 squared. And the idea is what you can do now is you can here feed in images that generate you these styles. So we can use that image to get a style vector. We can use that image to get a style vector. We can use that image to get a style vector. Um, and depending on where at which resolutions we're feeding it in, we're gonna get a different effect of the respective output. And this is the generated output then. You already can see that this is a very high quality result, also at a relatively high resolution. I think this is still 1024. Um, and now the idea though is, because we have these, these multi -resolution, um, separa this multi-resolution separation of the styles, we can now go ahead and can change the styles at every resolution independently. So I can go ahead and, and change the styles only at this resolution. I will have a specific effect here I can change here the mid-resolution. Again, I will get a certain specific effect here and so on. Right? So let's have a look how this looks like in practice. Um, so in this case, the coarse styles are being changed, right? Um, so this changes kind of the high-level appearance of the face, right? If you change the mid-styles, you see, well, that the, the, the coarse style of the face is roughly the same, right? The shape is more or less there. And then, like, the finer you go, the more you're changing the local, the high frequency appearance, but the global part, the global structure is already been fixed, right? And this one is mostly, the most control is basically here, and then the fine scale control is basically here. Uh, well, I mean, depending how fine you go, right? Um, and I think that's pretty interesting. Um, they're still not quite at the point where you can say, oh, I'm having like specific semantic features that I can change at different resolutions. But this one has actually, already some interesting control that you're having by having these different resolution levels. And I think that's a very cool thing. Um, well, aside from the fact, of course, that the outputs here, um, if you again, if you're starting this video again, right, um, they look really, really impressive. I mean, this is one of the state of the art papers here um, that uh, can do these kind of high quality images. It takes a lot of training, it takes a lot of GPUs and a lot of expertise in terms of tuning the hyperparameters, specifically to going, going up to, to this, um, yeah, relatively, relatively high resolution. I think that's one of the, yeah, that's one of the keys, right? I mean, the high resolution is something that is very tricky to achieve. And, um, but in a sense, you know, the, the supports it that you have these different resolution levels. Okay. Um, there's 
so this is a paper that has been published um, 2019. Um, it was actually a very popular paper, like everybody liked it because, you know, obviously the, the results here are pretty good. Um, and the same group actually, they published another paper on top of that, the style gain too. Um, um, this is actually a, a 2020 paper right now. And they basically still, they, they have a lot of analysis how they can still improve on the style gain, right? So they, they have really a detailed series of experiments in terms of, oh, what hyperparameters had, had which effect and so on. They're not, of course, claiming that they know, oh, this is the only combination of hyperparameters, but based on the original style gain model, they still show certain improvements. Sometimes they have these speckle artifacts and stuff like this. Um, and that is something they can actually, um, they did, uh, they did analyze very, very well, and the results are pretty good, actually. Um, this is another evaluation here. This is also an FID scores. Um, they basically train, you know, up to like eight, nine days, right? You see there's still a difference in terms of the, the quantitative evaluation here. So style gain one and style gain two. Style gain two with all of these hyperparameter optimizations they're making um, gets still a bit better. Um, an interesting high level change they're making is they don't use the progressive growing anymore. So for whatever reason, they found a way to train it without that. Um, I'm not arguing here for one or the other, um, but what's interesting is that, like it seems to be there's kind of a you know a series of islands in in these in these GAN models um, that that are good hyperparameters, right? So you have a bunch of a bunch of good settings that go together, uh, and in these ones they produce pretty good results. And as soon as you deviate from them, it's problematic. But there are other islands of hyperparameters that are also good. But it seems the challenge is to make the connections between those. Um, this is probably still one of the, the most tricky things. Um, I would really encourage you to have a look um, at this paper. This is a really nice paper to, to read and look at. Um, specifically, the reason why I think it's nice is they also have their models online um, and they have a really well-trained latent manifold space, right? So what you can do now is um, you can do things like take this pre-trained manifold with this paper, which is very tricky to do, right? Um, they train it also on um, faces and what you can do now is you can basically in this space have a parameter search that finds you good images and do things like image animation and so on, right? So you can basically in the latent space try to find good animation parameters, which means you just change the latent space Z um, to animate things like the, the face and so on. And it's a very nice separation sometimes um, in terms of shape, pose and so on. Um, they have also a bunch of really cool scripts online. So they have already optimization scripts that help you find um, these latent space parameters. Um, we have a couple of theses actually in our lab right now um, that work with that. Um, if you're interested in GANs, this is definitely a must paper to look at. It's a, it's a really, it's very recent. Um, it's pretty cool, um, pretty cool demos that they have. Um, and you can really do cool research on top of it by using their pre-trained models and doing things like, I don't know, with, um, we're trying to do stuff like, oh, give me audio signal, try to look up the animation for the face and stuff like that. So this is kind of nice, right? You can, you can do a couple of, of pretty interesting um, things here. Okay, um, obviously the GAN research, as you see, this is a 2020 paper, is still super, super relevant and it's super, um, super interesting, right? I mean, this is like, um, no, nothing really works when you start, but then, you know, after some time it gets better and better. And um, so it's kind of an interesting research trajectory. Um, in addition to GANs, I wanted to also mention what autoregressive models are doing. Um, autoregressive models and GANs is kind of these two generative models that we mostly use in practice. Um, Network-wise, often similar, but paradigm-wise, very different. So if you're talking about autoregressive models, um, or like, let's say if you have GANs, right, what we did with GANs, we just have a data set. Um, and what we're doing is we're hoping that our model learns this implicit distribution of this data, right? Um, so the hope is I'm going to give you, I don't know, like a few hundred thousand images, right, of faces, and I'm going to train again. Um, and then I'm going to get a model that replicates the distribution of these faces. And based on these hundred thousand faces, I can go ahead and generate another millions or tens of millions of different faces that look realistic that match this original distribution, but are actually not part of the training set anymore, right? But in this training process of the GANs, there's no explicit notion of ever saying, oh, this has to follow a certain distribution. Um, 
Yeah, this is also a problem, of course, because that makes the training so tricky. I can't verify is it actually fulfilling the distribution and so on. The only thing what I can do is I can do things like um, I can use use Wasserstein um, losses that tell me oh how close are the distributions matching and so on. So there's a couple of ideas we, we've looked at, but nonetheless, modeling the distribution um, in this implicit fashion is very difficult. So autoregressive models kind of do the other way around. So in this case, what you're doing is you um, you basically have a loss function that models the distribution, right? So the output are probabilities, for instance, with a softmax. And because you have a softmax, right, you, you make sure that this is a probability that models your distribution, right? And this is governed by a prior imposed by the model structure. Um, autoregressive models are very, very popular still. Um, they're state-of-the-art methods on, um, on, on images, of course. I'll show a few. Um, they produce pretty good results. The early results, I would say, in order recursive models had very similar problems than GAN results. But again, this is not about, like, I don't want to just talk about, oh, this paper produces good results, this one doesn't. Um, I think what's very important is to see kind of high-level trends and concepts in order to figure out, you know, what are the next steps for, for new and good research and what are the things that are worthwhile uh, looking at in the future. Um, yeah. Um, I should also say autoregressive models are very, very popular still in the, or are probably the most popular versions um, for other domains than images too, like audio and so on. But we'll see this um, probably in, in, in one of the future lectures I've been um, talking about things like WaveNet or so. Um, there has been a lot of, a lot of work uh, on that. And, and one of the differences there is probably that you have instead of images, right, you have like a few quote unquote pixels. Um, and we're like audio, so you would have um, a smaller dimension, right? You only have a, a one-dimensional signal, but you have more samples still. Okay, so one of the first papers there I would like to mention is pixel RNN. And um, pixel RNN is kind of a, yeah, one of, I mean, it's not the first autoregressive papers. There have been papers before, of course, and there's a long history of that. Um, but pixel RNN was one of the papers that did this successfully, I would say, on, on natural images. So the idea is, the only thing you're feeding into this model is also um, a set of images. And basically what you want to do is you want to model the distribution um, by, a, by a sequence of pixels, right? So what you're doing is you interpret the, the pixels of an image as a product of conditional distributions, right? So in other sense, if I look at the first pixel, right? Um, um, so I have a data set, right? And I'm just looking at the first pixel. I'm just checking out. I'm trying to fit a distribution with a network, of course, um, that can predict what color this pixel has, the very first pixel, right? If I'm looking at the second pixel, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to check on the conditional probability what the first pixel was based on the data set, what is the most likely color for the next pixel? And I'm gonna go and continue that. So I'm doing the third pixel, right? Taking the first two and so on. So I'm gonna successively add more and more pixels um, in this conditional probabilistic formulation, right? Um, and essentially it maps down to a sequence problem. So modeling an image is just a sequence of predicting pixel by pixel by pixel by pixel. Um, in practice, you also predict pixel um, by um, one at a time. Um, and the pixels um, are determined by all previously predicted pixels. So it's a conditional probability we have, right? Um, pixel RNN suggests, based on the name, what it already says, right? Um, use a recurrent neural network in order to model this probabilistic prediction, right? This conditional sequence here, right? Um, in practice, it looks like that. Um, let's say we have an n squared image, right? So we have here um, n pixels here and we have here n pixels so we have n pixels in the rows n pixels in the column um, and what we would like to do is we would like to go ahead and predict the color the probability of the color of this pixel here right and the way you're doing it is you're just looking at all the past right at all of these in the past at all the pixels here and here and here and here um, and you're multiplying based on the previous predictions what is the most likely probability um, for a given color on the current uh, on the current pixel, right? Um, in principle, it's very easy. Um, the easiest way to think of it, if you look at the first pixel, right? This doesn't have any predecessors, so this is literally just modeling the distributions of the very first pixels in all images. Um, and you can see here that this can actually get 
quite long, right? Um, well, it's, in this case, it's n squared pixels. So you can already guess, well, doing this for high resolutions is, um, is at least challenging, right? Because you, you, you have a very long sequence in this RNN model. Um, in this case, what we're doing is we're predicting a single pixel color per pixel. Um, in practice, when you have something like RGB, um, you simply expand your sequence and for every pixel, um, you're gonna you're gonna have three sequence steps, right? So you're saying first you predict R, then G, um, and then B, which is again this conditioned on on all the previous pixels and it's conditioned on the on the two previous colors, whereas R is always only conditioned on the previous pixels and so on, right? So in this case, this product just becomes three times the length um, because you're predicting R, B, and G uh, values independently. Um, it makes the sequence longer, but in principle, the, the theoretical part of the um, uh, of the model is, is 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 not changed, right? It's still the same idea. You still have this RNN um, that goes over all the all the pixels and all the colors then too, right? Um, question is still, how do we model the predictions in one pixel? Pixel RNN, um, as I said, it's an explicit um, distribution, and the way it's modeled is a softmax. So you're saying for one pixel value you're having 255, um, uh, you have basically a bit, right? So you have uh, 255 different values. Um, in this case, we have um, a softmax formulation. So um, we're treating each of them equally. Um, and all you're doing right now is you're feeding in your, again, let's, let's look at the first pixel here, right? You have your training set, and all you're trying to do is um, predict what is the probability of a certain color to be coming for that pixel, right? Um, if all my training images were green, then my probability would be pretty high to have green, right? Um, if not, if it's mixed, then it would basically give a different distribution, right? So that's kind of the high-level idea what we're having here. Um, in the RGB case, I would simply have um, three times uh, 256 ways of maxes, right? That's, um, that's ignored here, um, but it's pretty straightforward. So you, you train it by, by simply going ahead and saying, oh, I'm just looking at my, at my training data, I have all my images, and all I'm trying to do is I'm trying to ex formulate it based on the data set and based on the previously predicted pixels, what is the most likely next prediction, right? And it's of course, it's all completely self-supervised, right? I don't need any labels. All I have to do is I have to look at the images and I have to figure out what is the most likely next prediction in this model. Now, um, the, the tricky thing about pixel RNN, of course, is um, the sequence is very long, right? This is a, 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 it's a, it's a pretty big issue. Um, there's two things why this is problematic. Um, first of all, for training, it's, it's an issue. Um, I have to basically train this whole RNN, right? That's, a, that's challenging. I might have vanishing gradients in my RNN, um, and it might take, a time, make, might take some time to train it, right? Um, the other thing, though, is, um, it might also take quite some time to evaluate because what I have to do at test time, I have to basically run one network for every pixel, right? Again, what I'm doing is I'm running one network to evaluate one of these probabilities. That's basically how it's being formulated in the naive version. Um, and so I have to run the network first for this pixel, then for that pixel, then for that pixel and so on, right? So there's not a lot of parallelism going on at this point. Now, um, this was a paper that was published 2016, and after that, people thought, yeah, what are the variations of that, and what can we do with it? And the interesting thing is, um, the methodology people were really excited about, so what they thought is, maybe there's different ways of how we change the ordering here in terms of dependencies, right? So, one variation of this, we can use a row LSTM model architecture. Um, so, the image is processed row by row. Um, we have a hidden state of of a pixel and that depends on three pixels above respectively. Um, so the idea is we have something like this. So if we're having this pixel that is being predicted right now, right? Um, we basically depend on these pixels here at the top respectively, right? Um, not the previous pixel, right? That's the, the difference from the naive version of the pixel RNN, right? If I took this pixel, I would again, I would have also this, this pyramid here that, that respectively I only take the three previous ones here, right? Um, so the advantage here is the, the sequence length is a lot shorter. That's, that's one big advantage, right? Um, I don't have to basically go through here, then through here, and then through here to predict that pixel, but instead I can only, I can take this one. 
Um, the other thing that's pretty nice is I can compute pixels in one row in a parallel. So this pixel here and this pixel here can be computed in parallel in principle, right? right. Which, is, which is pretty nice. Um, in this case, I can basically implement it on a GPU, right? I basically start multiple CUDA accounts at the same time and I'm, I'm predicting that at the same time. So that is, um, that is pretty nice. That's a big advantage of this LSTM model and it kind of makes it actually practical. Um, the downside is we have now this pixel here is not being used as input to that pixel anymore, right? So every pixel in one row would get independent predictions. So we kind of have incomplete context for this one pixel. Um, you could say that's okay, right? Um, and in practice, it might be okay, right? Um, but there's, there's, there's this thing you have to keep in mind that basically you don't condition it anymore on the previous pixels in one row, right? So you would only take the ones that are above. Um, and, and then what happened was pretty funny. Um, a lot of, there were a lot of different variations now being proposed. Um, this is a, a row LSTM model, right? Um, and then people tried um, a diagonal by LSTM model, right? So in this case, um, uh, you basically start here, right? You basically condition this. So this guy is conditioned on that one, this guy is conditioned on that one, this guy is conditioned on these two, this guy is conditioned on these two, and so on, right? Um, the advantage here is, again, I have a much shorter sequence length than the naive um, RNN, right? Because if I get this one, I only need to go here. Uh, if I go here, I also need to go one here, one here, right? So that's a lot easier. Um, and based on this pattern here, I'm solving this incomplete context problem, um, what I had in this row-based LSTM. Right, so I'm, I'm, I'm again making sure that all my previous predictions at some point influence some future predictions, which is what you want to have, right? Um, so in this case, right, this guy here is actually being influenced by every pixel here before, right? Which is nice. That's what we want to have. So the hidden state of the pixel um, of a specific pixel, when you do this in practice, depends on two previous pixels, namely this one and that one, which is nice. Um, and... The good thing is you can actually still do the processing in, in, in a diagonal way, right? I could also, so this, so let's, let's see, this pixel here only depends on that pixel, right? That one I can process. Um, this pixel here depends also on that pixel and on that pixel. And this pixel depends on that pixel. So this, this, and this pixel, I can process in parallel. This pixel, that pixel, that pixel and that pixel doesn't depend on each other. That one I can also process. So we have this, this diagonal parallelism that we can do, right? Which is nice. Um, so we have some parallelism and we're solving this incomplete context problem. Um, so this is a thing that people have been basically doing when, when this pixel on and paper came out. Um, it solved this incomplete context problem while still allowing for some parallelism to be processed, right? Um, yeah, in the in the in the pixel RNN architecture, um, the idea to to implement it then in practice was you had these mass convolutions, so only previously predicted values can be can be used as context, right? So, in other words, we have basically different masks. So we have here whatever was previously processed. We have R, G, and B, and basically what you want to do is right in order to get the respective next one. You, you're cutting off the connections here, right? So here the context is not being used for these ones, and here basically this B is cutting off uh, for that one, right? Um, and uh, in this case, we have two different masks. We have one mask that uh, uh, during the first con conf that restricts the context, right? That's what's happening here. So this context is not being used here, right? And we have a mask B um, uh, for, for the subsequent confs, right? Um, and masking is simply done by setting the respective values to zero. And, and by this way, by using these masks, you can enforce that the network is just not forwarding whatever the current uh, image has seen, right? So the reason why we need the mask is basically we're seeing an image and the way we're training it is we're simply masking out the current pixel and based on the previous predictions or based on the previous pixel that we have in this image, we're trying to predict the current pixel, right? That's why but we, in order to do that, we need to mask out the current pixel. Otherwise, you would just forward it, right? So there would be no learning going on. So in this case, the network is being forced with these masks um, to learn based on all the previous pixels, 
what is the probability of the current pixel color, right? Um, okay, um, so this is pixel RNN. Again, this was one of the, the first papers that did it basically on images um, in this autoregressive fashion. Um, and they got a result that looked like these ones. Um, again, don't, don't touch the quality maybe too much at this point. This was the paper in 2016. Um, this was trained on ImageNet, so it's a pretty difficult data set. Uh, you see, you know, it's it's challenging. <laughs> it's not it's not not that high quality what we have seen like the things like Stalgen or so right now. Um, but it also is not at the at the same hyperparameter level. But um, at the time being, um, this was considered to be an interesting alternative to GANs, um, and it showed actually quite some some promising results. So people thought, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty cool idea. Um, we can probably use it. Um, now the one thing. Um, what I mentioned already is uh, is this dependency causes a couple of issues, right? So with pixel RNs, you have this issue that you have to go through this, like you have to have an LSTM architecture to, to model the sequence, right? That's that's the challenge. Uh, it's not just challenge from a training perspective, but it is also challenging from a um, evaluation perspective. So in practice, this becomes very very costly. And there's been kind of a follow up version. Um, by a similar set of authors, author also from um, uh, now DeepMind. Um, and in this case, we wanted to, to think about, can we, can we use convolutions there instead of this, this, this uh, CNN? So we're using kind of a mask version of convolutions. Um, but, let's, um, but let's have a look again, right? So the problem is this row and diagonal LSTM, they have this issue of this potentially un unbounded dependency range, right? Um, which which depends obviously on the pixel uh, on the on the image size, right? So that's a big problem, and this this is computationally very very challenging. We'll see this later on also when people do it in audio, like these first wavenet models that took a really long time to evaluate, um, and people had to think about you know doing something potentially a little bit smarter there. Okay, um, so pixel CNN. The idea now is. Um, we're using standard convolutions to capture a bounded receptive field. So one layer has a bounded receptive field. You can set the receptive field to a specific size. So for one given layer, you see only in the past to a specific size. And because of that, all pixel features can be computed at once um, during training. And during testing, it's very similar. Um, uh, but basically during training, this is a massive, a massive speed up, right? Um, and in practice, it's going to look like that. Um, you're going to have an architecture that looks roughly like this. Um, we have here input, um, RGB, we have height and width, right? We have this mask A convolution, um, similar to the mask we've seen before, but this is now a 2D convolution here, right? Um, we have a resonant block, relo, conf, relo, conf, and then a softmax, right? <coughs> um, okay, and the idea now is this mask, what it's doing, it simply, for the current prediction, is at the center of the mask. You're masking out the entire future context, including the pixel itself, right? So it doesn't see the pixel itself. It doesn't see anything of the future. And the idea is, if you're applying this mask to every pixel, you're naturally getting a similar pattern than what the pixel RNN would be doing, right? So, um, yeah, you, you, you're simply masking out uh, the future blocks here, right? Um, and that is much nicer to do now. That is um, because this model here preserves the spatial dimensions and the mask convolutions can be simply there to, to mimic the same behavior of the sequence, right? They simply avoid, you don't see the future context. You're still basically conditioning, conditioning the current pix pixel predictions or the current feature generation based on, on, the, current, uh, on, the, on the previous pixels, right? Um, so they have these gated pixel CNNs, they have these gated blocks. Um, basically, they're using these masks, right? Um, another thing they're doing is they, they realized um, if they just used the mask with pixel CNN and pixel RNN, the pixel CNN didn't perform so well. Uh, and one hypothesis was that um, the, uh, the, the LSTM with the, with, the, with the sigmoid and the 10H functions, they actually help. Um, they didn't quite, you know, it was not quite clear why, but basically the expectation was that the sigmoid and the 10H functions, they were better. So now what happened, these gated pixel CNNs, um, these gated blocks basically, 
they're using also 10H and sigmoid functions, and then you have an ele element-wise product. So again, what's happening here is you have the kth layer, right? These are the weights. These are the weights. You're feeding in the current input. Um, you have a sigmoid, you have a 10H, uh, then you have an element multiplication, and then you're getting the current, the current output of this, uh, of this block. And the idea was by replacing the relus with this gated block of sigmoids and 10Hs, it's kind of very similar um, what the LSTM is doing, right? And if they did that, they noticed, oh, okay, we're getting better, uh, better performance outputs again in this case, right? Um, and this is kind of the, the high level idea um, of the pixel CNNs, right? In this case, this is literally this gated block is basically mimicking what the pixel RNN is doing, but now the difference is it's computationally much, much more efficient. Um, it has one downside, um, and there's a blind spot actually, if you're looking closely. So let's say we have here a 555 image, right? Um, uh, in this case, we have a 555 image, and let's say we have a three by three convolution. Uh, what we want to do, right, is we basically, in order to go from here to the next layer, we are now applying this 3 by 3 conf at all valid locations, right? So, you know, we're just sliding this 3 by 3 image here through uh, until we get here to the middle, right? So this is the last one. And when you're seeing the last one here, uh, you notice very quickly that in order to compute this output here, you're never going to see this pixel here as input, right? Um, if I'm going here to the respective next one, I have the same issue. So if I'm going, if I'm applying the, the filter kernel here, it doesn't take this pixel here. This pixel here is missing right now, right? So again, it, let's start over. It starts here, dip, dip. This pixel here is never being used, right? Here it's masked out and then it's not used, right? This one here in the next row would also not be used, right? Um, and that is, that is this blind spot. So basically this pixel here is unseen context. In this blind spot, this goes all the way through the, through the, through the image actually, right? Um, and that's a bit of a problem because now you, you're gonna having the situation where you have kind of this unseen context that is not being used for the respective uh, future predictions, right? Um, yeah, the question is, how can you avoid this with a series of convolutions? Um, there's a relatively simple idea behind it. Um, you just have to apply the convolutions and modify the kernels a little bit. And um, this blind spot uh, can be evaluated by, by splitting the convolutions in two stacks. So you have a horizontal stack and you have a vertical stack, right? So in this case, um, you have in here the vertical stack. Um, and you have a horizontal stack here of convolutions. And the idea is you first run the vertical stack and then you're running the horizontal stack, right? So that's kind of the, the high level idea. Um, in this case, this vertical stack makes actually sure that you're taking all of the, uh, of the inputs um, uh, here in. And it's a very simple idea. It comes a little bit of overhead because now we have two, um, two stacks basically, and that makes it a little, a little bit harder to do. For whatever reason, my window just decided to open. Let me see if I can actually close that again. Uh, of course, it doesn't work. Uh, whatever, let's just go ahead. And let's see if I can move this one down a little bit. Okay. Um, all right, so we can eliminate the blind spot. Um, oh, this is really distracting, actually. All right, I'll leave it on. Um, thanks, computer science building. Well, if anybody complains about the video quality now, please please send an email to our custodians um, not to automatically remove the blinds when the sun is like really burning here. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so we're eliminating the blind spot. Um, we can also do relatively th simple things um, like uh, conditional pixel CNN. Um, basically, what we can do is when we're applying these blocks here, like this one here, right? Um, we can do conditional image generation by simply um, appending a vector here and here, respectively, 
to the weights that are multiplied with the respective inputs, right? Um, this is simply a, a latent vector that is used for the conditioning, right? In this case, you can use a class vector. So let's say I have a classifier from a network, right? I'm using these class specific features and I'm appending them here to indicate, oh, this is a specific class, right? Um, and this gives some control. It's actually very similar to um, things like picks to picks, um, where you uh, where you basically have also some sort of uh, yeah where the discriminator sees uh, the different conditionings. In this case, we simply have this um, condition latent vector here. Okay, um, if we are running this model, um, we're getting results that um, look like these ones. Um, so this one is on on coral reefs. Um, and, uh, and horses, right? So you see, well, you know, you're getting getting realistic images here as output, right? Um, you have these horses, they look like horses. Um, if you're looking closely, you will see the resolution is not so high. Um, but again, you have to you have to make a fair comparison here. This is a model that was um, uh, that was trained 2016, right? It's already um, quite some time ago, but the pixel scene and model is actually something people have been working on and they have improved it. It also got better hyperparameters. Um, and yeah, the, the results I think got also better over time. I'll show you in a sec, like what state of the art can do here. Um, but I think it's a very interesting question of what generative model you want to use, right? Do you want to rather use autoregressive models or do you rather want to use GANs? Um, the big advantage of autoregressive models is this explicit modeling of the probability densities gives you much more stable training. Um, like training a pixel CNN, I mean, again, it's computationally also costly, right? But it's not gonna be like this crazy hyperparameter tuning, um, like what you have to do for GANs, right? That is that is a really, a really big advantage. So I would say the training is much, much easier. It's much more stable. Um, and this is something that is worthwhile doing. Um, it can be applied to both discrete and continuous data, as long as you can model a, a probability. Um, Many times what you see is people go ahead and discretize the data and use something like a softmax to model it. Um, uh, we'll see in the next lectures also a few more examples of, of, of these cases where autoregressive models have been very, very successful. So one case I've mentioned is the audio case. Another case will be shape modeling. There was a very popular paper, uh, Polychen, um, that came out only a few weeks ago that is also falling into this autoregressive category. So from a pure theoretical standpoint, from your toolbox of deep learning tools, um, yeah, autoregressive models are very, very important, actually. Um, yeah, the advantages of GANs, um, empirically, people think, oh, you know, they can produce higher quality images. Um, I think, you know, the community is developing in certain ways. Um, sometimes these are a bit better, sometimes these. Um, it is indeed true that the GANs currently produce better results. Um, they're also faster to train. Um, they're faster to train, but they're much more difficult to train, right? So this is kind of the the, the pros and the caveats what, what we're having about uh, about these models. Um, I also wanted to show this is one of the very recent results on autoregressive models. Um, this VQ VAE2, uh, it's basically a variational um, autoencoder, and they have a very they have a, a vector quantized um, formulation, um, and these results are pretty impressive, right? Um, if you're looking closely, they might not quite be at the same level what um, you know what uh, StyleGAN is doing these days, um, but still very impressive. Also high resolution. Um, also takes a long time to train, um, but but super impressive results, right? It's very um, it's very interesting. So if you're interested in these results, look at this paper. This is also 2019 paper. Very active research area. Um, there's still a lot of improvements that can be made. You know, like how to quantize things what encoders to use, what losses you're using and stuff like that. So there's a lot of lot of interesting design choices still in the architectures here. Okay, good. Um, yeah, with that, I would like to, um, well, more or less conclude um, the generative models on images. Um, but now I want to, to see how can we do things um, on videos. And <laughs> as, as you can imagine, you know, like going from an image, which is already a high resolution, going to videos, which is a, a much, much, much higher resolution, um, is a very, very challenging endeavor. And I would say there's still two different categories. One category is, you know, like what again is doing, a purely generative model, go from a latent vector to a video. Um, but then there's also methods that go from 
more like this conditional GAN case, right? So you have some guiding and then you can go there. Um, but let, let's go to the first case first, right? I want to go ahead now and basically say, well, give me one or multiple random vectors um, and generate, generate a video um, as the output. Um, and let's have a very simple version first. Let's go back to GANs for a time being. And let's imagine how would we do this on, on, on videos. If you, if, you, if you had to design your own GAN model, um, what are the options? How would you design your architecture? Very naively, right? Like without thinking too much. Um, if we are looking at, at GANs, right? We know we have a latent code Z. And basically there's two options, right? One thing I can do is I can say I have a single random variable that is used to generate and determine the entirety of the video, right? So one single vector determines every single frame that comes out of it, right? Um, in this case, um, well, the output is very high dimensional, of course. Um, the question is basically, how do I know when to stop? Um, so if you did this past, uh, part here, what you could do is I can go ahead, have a GAN that gives me a latent code Z. I could do something like an LSTM, right? And I could predict in the first frame from latent vector Z, I predict one image, right? That one, something I can do. Now, if I want to predict the next frame and only condition that one frame on the previous frame, you're gonna gonna have this issue that for this one frame, you're always gonna get the next, the same next frame. Um, and you will see that this is already fundamentally a challenging issue because if I'm gonna do that, I like if if I'm in a real scenery, right? Of course, for a given still frame, I can have multiple future predictions where this video would develop. So if I use the latent code Z only to predict the first frame and then only use the first frame to predict the next frame, the next frame to predict the very next frame and so on, um, I would not have a lot of variety in the video, like how the motion would go, right? I would only keep basically the current frame. Um, and this is the challenge. Now, if I only have a random Z, this Z needs to be also input in some way to the next frame, right? Because again, otherwise you're going to have this issue that if you'd only predicted on the previous frame, um, you only go, you always will get the same motion. In practice, you get no motion. In practice, this is just going to mode collapse. Um, so you have to have a way to get the Z to the very next frame propagated in one way or another, either the feature maps, right, or the Z directly by itself. Um, yeah. So future frames deterministic given the past, right? That's a big that's a big challenge we have to address here. So this this is this thing. If you have a, a single vector Z, that's a problem, right? Um, the second option is, what you can do is, I can go ahead and have a random variable that generates me frame A. The first frame is generated with, with one random seed. Um, I'm gonna have another random vector Z. I'm gonna generate the next frame. I'm gonna have another random vector that generates the very next frame. So by doing that, um, I can draw basically independent frames with independent Z's if I have trained again. Now the challenge is, of course, if I want to have a video, I need to have, in addition to that, some conditioning to each other. Um, and well, what you can do now is generate the first frame, wouldn't have any previous conditioning, right? It has, it has, it has no past frames. Um, the next frame would get as input a single, um, a single, uh, a single random vector again for the current frame as well as the previous image. So the, the task in this case would be take previous frame plus take new rate in code Z, generate the next frame that corresponds to each other. Um, you can do that. Um, so basically what I just described is you need this conditioning for the future from the past. But the big challenge you're gonna get now when you train this, how to get the combination of past frames plus the random vectors during training, right? So if I have a given video, right? I gave this one a latent vector Z and I'm generating the next frame with another latent vector Z. Um, in my training sample in this video, I combined, I have some implicit correlation between the frames, right? 
but I don't have a correlation between the latent codes. And that makes it very tricky to train because how do you get this combination right between training and test? So this is very tricky here to get to work. Um, if you train this naively, um, often what happens is it simply ignores the latent vector of the previous, of the future frames, right? Uh, so this is very challenging here. So we're having two, two, two options and both of them have problems, right? Um, and there's channel issues. The channel issue is how do we make sure we get temporal coherency, right? How do we make sure we're not jumping around? Again, if I'm just having a GAN and drawing two frames um, or generate two images, they aren't going to be two frames, right? They're just going to be random stuff. Um, so that's a big issue, how to get the temporal coherency. In practice, I need to have some part in my discriminator that tells me, oh, don't flicker, be smooth, be a real video and stuff like that, right? Um, the second problem what you're going to have is there might be some drift over time um, and often what happens if you're running these video generation methods that exist right now, they often collapse to an average frame, right? The first few frames are fine and then we have longer sequences, they drift away. And you're going to have a pretty interesting problem also to deal with. Uh, when you're training it, what you do is, let's say you have a sequence model that predicts frame by frame. If you have a sequence model for frame by frame, uh, you're taking the previous frames as input. Now, you're training obviously on ground truth frames here as input here. But when you're testing, you're having the previous predictions. So suddenly with previous predictions, you're not in the ground truth anymore. And the further you go, the more you drift away what is ground truth. So in principle, that the quality will degenerate uh, at some point. So this drift, um, possibly mod collapse to a mean image, is a very, is a very problematic case for videos. Um, yeah, I wanted to show one architecture. This is an, uh, a paper from uh, DeepMind, DVD-GAN. Um, this is a paper also from 2019. You can see <laughs> videos are very challenging still. Um, what they do is basically, uh, I don't want to go into all the details because there's, there's a lot of variations of this. A lot of the stuff is, is crazy hyperparameter tuning. Uh, they have a, a random distribution here, right? Um, they have a one, one hot class vector. Um, and what they're doing is, they're basically saying, oh, you're using this one vector, you're distributing it in one way or another to multiple frames. You have for every frame, you have basically a generator then, but it's determined by this one random vector. Um, so this one guy determines all of them at the same time, um, right? Uh, and the discriminators, what they're doing is basically, they're taking the stack of this stuff in, right? Uh, and they're telling you, is it again, uh, a reasonable sequence, right? Um, again, I don't want to go into detail, but the interesting thing is what you see is here, the discriminators, they can't just look at a single image, of course, right? They need to look at more stuff at the same time in order to make sure, is it a video? Um, so this is one of the state-of-the-art papers. Um, you typically get results that look like these ones. Um, you have here different resolutions. This is 256, this here is 128, and this one is 64. Um, you see very quickly the sequences are not so long. You're going to get very short sequences because longer sequences, this drifting problem is a massive issue. Um, you can see you get some results that look reasonable. Um, here you have the surfer video, right? Um, but you can already see the quality of these videos is significantly lower than whatever people have been doing with things like Stallion and so on, right? Um, so doing this from scratch is, is challenging. And again, this one was a state-of-the-art uh, example. So most of the time, these things are trained on, on the Kinetics data sets. This is Kinetics 600, right? Um, they train it up to 48 frames, right? 48 frames is like less than two seconds, probably, if you're assuming like 30 frames a second. So you see, this is still a pretty, this is a challenging problem, right? <laughs> the output is pretty hard. Um, it's pretty interesting. Um, the one thing <laughs> what I should say, there's a bit of a cheat you can do for video generation. Um, one thing you could do instead of training this completely from scratch, you could go ahead and take um, something like StyleGAN, take the manifold, and you just try to figure in this manifold what would be the next space, uh, what would be the next frame. And this is something that works surprisingly better actually. Um, but, but generating the frames completely from scratch is, is still very difficult. Again, this is a really impressive paper and these guys, they really know what they're doing. This is like, they've been working on this for quite a while. This is, um, this is not straightforward to get these to these results. Um, but it is, of course, very interesting. 
Um, to do this, ideally we would want to also have better operators, not just 2D convolutions, maybe some video based convolutions, right? That would consider the whole um, context at the same time. So doing this from scratch is very difficult. Um, I mentioned you want remedy, possibly using a pre-trained manifold. Um, there's another potential remedy. And it turns out conditional GANs are much better for videos. Uh, this is a paper, um, this is pix to pix HD here. This is run simply on a frame to frame basis, right? What you're doing here is you're taking the semantics here as input um, and you're running this pix to pix model from the semantics to get to here. Um, again, of course, it's flickering this, but in the network here, there's absolutely zero temporal coherency, right? There's no temporal constraints between the different frames. The only temporal coherence we're getting here is based on these labels. The assumption is if these labels are temporally consistent, you will also get temporal consistent output. The next assumption is if this input is over constraining the output enough, and is deterministic, meaning we have enough information and it would always produce the same result, which in practice you don't, of course, but if it did, you would also get better predictions, right? Um, and I would say, if I'm playing this again, it's actually not too bad, right? Yes, it is flickering, it's not perfect, but the car is here, all is there, of course, it's here too. Um, there's a bit of inconsistency here in the labels, maybe if these ones were not there, it would be better. Um, but this one is already pretty good, I think, right? Uh, so the conditional case, is very encouraging because that is much easier than doing it from scratch. Um, there's still a challenge to get this one temporally consistent. Um, and there's also a follow-up paper from pix to pix basically, it's called wit to wit um, it's, um, it's basically using a sequential generator, right? So the idea what you have is you have the past L-generated frames, um, they wrote this down as this like nice formula, but in practice they said L to two, so they used two, two, two of the two of the past uh, frames, um, the last L source frames, right? Um, again, L is set to two, it's like basically taking the last two frames. Um, and then it's a conditional probability on the previously generated frames and the previously uh, conditioning frames, right? These two are being fed in to generate um, the next frame here as output, right? That's what we wanna do. Um, and of course, this is a sequence, so we have to also, we have to multiply these probabilities together. So we have a sequential generator, right? Um, that's the high level idea of doing bit to bit, video to video synthesis. Um, in this case, um, there's also two discriminator. One discriminator, DI, is trained to say, is it a real image? Um, and another discriminator, DV, is telling you, is it, is it temporally consistent? Uh, what these guys are doing roughly is, <clears throat> This DV here is just checking the flow, right? So you extract the flow from, a, from an image um, and you're telling it, oh, whatever you generated is that corresponding to flow what you would expect in the real video. So is the, the motion kind of smooth, is it consistent, stuff like that. That's something this discriminator would be, would be doing. Um, so the full objective here is basically we have um, the loss from the image here, right? This is Li, um, Di, uh, and you have um, F and DV, right? So you train these two jointly, um, which is which is pretty good. Um, I can I can say, however, this paper has a lot of finicky details. It's very tricky to train and probably also tra trains around a week, um, even for the simple data sets. But the results look really impressive. Um, that's why I wanted to show it. Um, so this is an example here where we see here again the input labels. Uh, labels. Uh, we see here pix to pix HD. Um, this is another baseline. Um, and here's pix, uh, here's bit to bit basically, right? And now if you're running this, we can run this here. Um, if you're looking here, this one actually looks, if you're looking at it very closely, I think this looks really amazing actually. Uh, it did a, 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 a couple of funny things like the road here, the, these, these line markers, it's not quite clear what's happening there, right? But if you're just looking roughly at the, at the, at the motion here, it looks actually uh, pretty good, right? Um, so this one I would say is probably state of the art um, and compared to the purely generative case, this conditional case is significantly easier to train. I think that's cool, right? I mean, you get pretty good results with that. Um, so yeah, if you're looking again at the key ideas here, um, we need two discriminators, right? We need to figure out, is it a real image and also is it a good sequence? Th this one is very important. 
In this case, it's based on optical flow. There's probably other versions how to do that. Um, you need to consider the recent history of previous frames. In this case, the set it to two. Well, I mean, they wish they probably wanted to set it to something larger, but I think at some point you just run out of GPU memory, right? Um, that's that's the practical that's the practical issue. Um, yeah, we have to basically consider the recent history and then we train all of these things jointly. That's kind of the uh, the key idea. Um, yeah, so which is super nice. So this conditioning makes the whole problem of video generation very tractable. Um, that's also something um, um, that we've been doing in the context of faces. Um, this was a collaboration with the MPI together. Um, the, the video portrait paper, um, it's, I would say it's a relatively popular paper, what we had, um, is kind of building on these blocks too. So the idea is you can say, well, we want to condition basically, we want to generate the conditioning on the fly in order to control, control the respective video output. And the video portraits, the idea is what you want to do is you want to take a face here um, of Obama, you want to take this video and you want to control and animate the face here, right? Um, it's a very interesting thing what you can do here, right? Um, in this case, what, what the conditioning of the network is, is only this right hand side. This is essentially, it's essentially a version of pix to pix It's a bit of a more fancy version. It uses multiple frames at the same time as input and predicts only one output. So it sees the, it sees this, the temporal context. Um, didn't make the biggest of a difference. Um, but the key insight, what I want to say here is we have a bunch of synthetic rendering of faces here. Ignore the left-hand side right now. Just look at this part here in the middle. This part here in the middle is a bunch of synthetically rendered faces. In this case, it's just RTP values. These are 3D coordinates of the model. Uh, and these, it's a bit hard to see. These are the eye locations here. Um, all of these are, all of these three from one frame are stacked together. Um, they are f fed into this pix to pix. It's a unit version of a pix to pix, right? Um, and this network is being trained to generate realistic images from this one video sequence. This, this pix to pix here is only trained on one Obama video. Right? It's only trained on this one video. It's maybe a maybe thousand, two thousand frames. It's not so much, right? Um, so this network will make sure that whatever I'm feeding in here is correlated with whatever the Obama video is looking like. So please take this and make an Obama frame out of that. Again, it's also taking multiple frames here. I think we took five frames or so, uh, a window of five frames, took all of them as input and predicted only the middle frame. So the network sees the, the future and the past, but it didn't make the biggest of a difference. And I'll tell you in a second why it doesn't make such a big difference. Um, and the reason now is here how we generate this conditioning. The conditioning now, what you can do is you can take the original video, you can run a face tracker. The face tracker gives you a bunch of parameters like illumination, identity, pose, expression, and eyes, right? Basically, all of these things here, you can control with a 3D model. You can use a graphics method right now, take a GPU renderer, take these parameters here as input, and re-render them. So this re-rendering is, of course, not a realistic video because these parameters doesn't have stuff like the background, the shadow, um, yeah, and the material parameters and so on are also not super accurate. This is just a high-level representation, basically. Um, but the nice thing about this presentation is that it's fully controllable. So we can go ahead um, and change these parameters as we wish, right? We can just change the pose, we can rotate the head. We have an absolute notion in how to rotate the head. The ability what we don't have yet here on this part is just a forward GPU render. It looks kind of like a, like a video game from the 80s, so to say, right? Um, but in the combination now is we can have the control here on our track model and then use the network to make realistic videos out of it again. So in other words, we can now control this face. And the reason why this works is this tracking here is pretty accurate. Like this is a per pixel based tracking. It's based on um, methodology wise, it's similar to the face to face method, right? You can track a per pixel error here. Uh, you're getting very good fits of the face. Um, and this makes it relatively easy for the network to learn the correlation between this motion of the face here, or these pixels of the face here and respectively here. Um, but now what we can do is, of course, we can do edits. Uh, you can take a different source sequence um, to, to take a bunch, track the sequence, take a bunch of parameters here and recombine the parameters here um, and then render 
well, and then change basically, for instance, things like pose expression and eyes uh, in this rendering. And then the network again will make sure that we're getting a realistic Obama again, right? So in practice looks like that. Um, we have here the, the, the target model here of her. So we took her video, we reconstructed her face um, and here are the positions of the 3D model, here are the eyes. And now what we do is we have a source sequence. That source sequence is being used only to control the synthetic 3D model here, right? And then the neural network converts these three images again to a realistic face. Um, and if you're running that, you get results that look like these. Right? So you're seeing the motion here transferred to the synthetic model. And then the network makes sure that this one is, uh, yeah, it's basically recreated to a vid target video of her. And it's pretty interesting. Even the shadow here is, being, is, is moving around, right? In this model, there's no shadow, but the network learns, well, if the head goes left and right, the shadow also moved left and right. It doesn't have a correct illumination model or whatsoever, but it's just a very easy example because it's a portrait video and then it, it learns how to translate that, right? Um, so a few more examples. Here's, um, he's controlling the virtual face of Obama here, and the video is basically making sure um, that you can generate a realistic output here at the end, right? Um, yeah, the eyes are very important. You need a special image, otherwise the eyes are being ignored. Otherwise they're too small, um, of a region on the uh, on, and the loss to be considered, right? Um, that, that made this one to work. Um, you can do manual editing. You don't have to take a source sequence. You can now go ahead and take an arbitrary video, right, or image. Um, and you can basically specify how should the pose here of the person look like. Um, you can change the, the smiling parameters. In this case, that's part of a, of a PCA if you're interested in that. Um, yeah, you have to look at what the, the parameters of these face models are. But the interesting thing as part of this class here is really that by controlling the synthetic 3D model, we can generate a video out of it um, with a neural network. And again, this pixel-to-pixel -pixel model doesn't have a lot of temporal coherence. Yes, it sees a, a window, but the reason why this works is because we are seeing multiple frames at the same time. Uh, the reason why it works is because our tracking is temporally consistent, right? So the only temporal coherence, well, aside from this window, what we're getting is based on the training data. Um, here are a few more examples. Um, uh, we have here, uh, yeah, we, we just had a lot of fun with it, of course, right? You can basically uh, change and edit videos now in a, in a pretty arbitrary, arbitrary fashion. Okay, um, there's a couple of cool insights that I wanted to talk about. Um, the one thing <laughs> which I think is super surprising is, well, the synthetic data for tracking is a great anchor, right? Basically, this eliminates the strift problem that the standard GANs would have for videos. You're having basically a sequence of, of synthetic inputs that you just want to convert and translate to a different domain, but they serve as a great anchor. If they are temporally stable, your output will be also temporally stable. And that's pretty nice, right? So that's a pretty good thing. Um, the overfitting on small data sets for this kind of stuff works surprisingly well, right? We have maybe a few thousand frames of the video. Potentially get it with a few hundred, but a few thousand is probably better. But it's not like hundreds of thousands, right? Compared to like style gain or so, you need like hundreds of thousands of training frames and a lot of augmentation. Eh, much easier here, right? Much easier problem statement. Um, and can generate temporally consistent videos, right? Admittedly, of course, you need the conditioning, right? This is a, a big challenge. Um, yeah, the one thing you need to do is you need to stay within the training set. In other words, you, you cannot expect that this network generalizes to a sense that, hmm, yeah, I don't know, the person suddenly turns around, you have never seen the back of the, of the head. So of course you, you would never get any, any realistic results there, right? Um, so you have to stay within the training set with respect to motion, with respect to elimination, with respect to poses and stuff like that, right? So that's, that's the thing, yeah. Um, in a sense, what's pretty interesting about it um, I would like to think, make you think a little bit about what is learning actually, right? So learning in this case means in this training sequence that we're giving the network, we can interpolate. We can also extrapolate to some degree, but not too much, right? It's, there's no learning going on. It's just an optimization problem now. How do you recombine this existing training set and how do you encode it in the model um, with SGD? So it's kind of, an, the neural networks is more like an optimization framework. And I think that's, that's the thing that to me sounds, sounds very, very uh, appealing. I think this is a super cool research direction for the future. 
Um, this is something, if you're interested in research, this is something you should think about, right? Like how can we kind of leverage the advantages of deep learning frameworks for various optimization problems because they work so well. Um, so this is something what we've done on faces, but you can do this on other things too. You can do this on bodies. There's the super cool paper, Everybody Dance Now. Um, uh, this is a paper that was done at Berkeley um, by, um, uh, by Chan et al. Um, and what these guys are doing is a very similar idea, except they do it for human bodies. So what you do here is you take <coughs> as training, um, you basically have a pix to pix model. Right? So what you do is you have here y is the uh, input image. You have um, an extractor here that gives you a human skeleton. The human skeleton is, is generated in this case with, I think, OpenPose or so. It's just a, a standard um, deep learning library um, that figures out how to, how to get the poses here. This one is, I think, it's not even end-to-end -end trained, I think. Um, this is just a pre-processing step, basically, that gen generates you the skeleton for this video. Um, so you have the kinematics, basically. Now you take a generator that learns how do you go from here to the to the underlying video again. And then the discriminator takes the pair of the human skeleton with respect to the generated output and tells you is it real or is it is it fake? Um, and the real example is just, well, you do the same thing for the real image, you just track the skeleton and check, oh, these this is a pair that matches, right? Uh, so these two things say, oh, this is a real pair and this is the fake pair. And you know the discriminator and generator, same way as picks to picks, fights each other. Um, they also use um, AVGG laws here. They're basically saying, well, um, whatever you're generating here in feature space should match um, what you had originally, right? So you you want to make sure you're generating realistic images. They don't use an L1 loss here. They use AVGG laws. Um, and this one um, works actually um, works typically a bit better than the L1 loss, right? It doesn't have this over smoothing problem and so on. Um, but in this case, of course, it's super easy to get the ground truth data too, right? What you have to do is you just take a video, you run your, your skeleton tracker, you have these pairs, you have the pairs here for the VGG loss, you have this pair here uh, uh, for the skeleton, and you have here the ground truth pairs respectively, right? Um, and again, this network here, this generator, learns to only generate videos from this one given target sequence. It doesn't have to generalize between many sequences. It's, it's pretty cool, right? Um, and the transfer then works by simply saying, well, now what you're doing is you simply can animate the skeleton. Um, because you don't want to animate it by hand, you're just taking a different source sequence y, y prime. You're running the skeleton tracker here again using that skeleton, and then you, uh, you're feeding this one into the network. What they did is they normalized the skeleton, uh, because one thing they realized is if you take one video, the skeleton has a certain height. Um, depending on the on the on the person's <laughs> on the person, of course. Um, so there, there's some normalization step. There's a bit of augmentation step in how to deal with the skeleton. But the core idea is pretty straightforward, right? The core idea is you just take this input image, track it, feed in the generator, generator makes the real image out of it again, right? Sounds pretty easy, um, and they get pretty cool results. Um, I would really encourage you to check out their video. They also spend a lot of time in um, yeah in in, uh, in putting this video online. Um, it, it's artistically, I think it's very well done. This is also why it got a lot of attention. Right, you, can, you can see that. So this is source, this is the target, these were the training sequences, and now they're using the source and they're mapping the motion of him to her. Right? I mean, you see that the hands are not perfect, but you know, it looks, I think it looks pretty cool actually, right? And again, this is trained only basically on one sequence. Yeah, I think we should we should watch it a bit. I think it's a it's a cool video. I'm I'm always pretty excited um, because I think they did also a really good job in terms of uh, you know using the artistic content. Okay, so you see, um, I mean, of course, this is still a very simple setting, right? The camera points always front facing. Same with like the video portraits, always is very front facing, um, but it works surprisingly well for the simple setup. Um, they are still, I mean, the, the nice thing is here this works on different input. The problem, what you're seeing here often is, if you're looking at the arms, the arms here are pretty broken. Um, and of course, I, I kind of, um, I picked this example here where it doesn't work so well. Um, the reason why I wanted to show that specific example is, the reason why it doesn't work so well is because the tracker is not 100% accurate. If you had perfect tracking, I would expect this to work much better. 
for the faces you would not see that because but the face tracking is a bit accurate more accurate than the bodies um, by bodies i mean the the human skeleton the reason why it's challenging is well if you have an arm like this right you're gonna have this issue where exactly is my bone here in the middle uh, i just don't know it right there's no notion where the bone is you don't even have ground truth data for that right you can't do an x-ray like annotate stuff and so it's trickier right um, and this one makes this for body is still a bit more challenging. You see the resolution also on the face is not, not that high. Um, but the direction is really cool, right? So you can think about if you got possibly better tracking, you would probably also get better results here. Another thing we're seeing right now is this network here has no notion of 3D. Same for the video portrait, same idea, right? You have basically, you have some conditioning, you get a 3D proxy that renders stuff. Here in this case, the skeleton, the video portrait is about the face. Um, but there's no explicit 3D notion, right, um, in the network itself. The network is just a series of 2D convolutions. And I think that's, in a sense, a pretty bad design choice. So we'll go into this um, in the next lecture. Um, uh, but this is something I think that is still a drawback here. Um, but the insights, I think, here is the conditioning via tracking is super cool, right? I mean, it's just so much easier and you can do so much more cool stuff than generating stuff from scratch. Um, so the conditioning case of the of the GANs for videos, I think, is super exciting. I think that's a really nice uh, a nice direction. And we've just started, right? If doing a bunch of stuff on faces, people have done a bunch of stuff on on bodies now. Um, but you know, you you can basically create virtual reality things. You can do computer graphics now with neural networks and stuff like that. So that's 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 interesting. And it's surprisingly simple, right? Um, you, you just track the human skeleton um, and run it. Um, in this case, they run open pose, I think. Um, it's not so temporally stable. Could make this a bit better. Um, and so the, the, the tracking quality is everything here, right? Um, the fun fact was also after this paper came out, there were a couple of other papers that tried the same thing or they did similar things, similar ideas, of course, different hyperparameters, but this conditioning was kind of in the same spirit. Okay, um, that's all I wanted to say today. Um, in the next lecture, and we're going to talk about the shortcomings here. We're going to talk about the fact that we want to have a 3D notion in the network, actually. And this is what basically what neural rendering is. Like, this is also kind of neural rendering, what I've shown you right now. But I wanted to introduce what neural network, uh, what neural rendering is, go a little bit into 3D, 3D deep learning later. Um, and I hope, you know, that's going to be um, yeah, a cool thing um, for you to look at because I'm, that's something I'm very personally very excited about. This is also what a lot of research we're doing right now in my group. Okay, I hope you're still having fun on the projects. Um, otherwise, see you see you for the next lecture.